Well, good morning. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to our Staying Home and Staying Connected uh, webinar. Today's topic is how to protect your association from fraud. Uh, we're excited for to have you here today. Just a few quick notes. Um, if you haven't already put yourself on mute, please do so. You'll, you'll stay on mute the uh, entire um, webinar. We are going to talk about a little bit down the road here how to ask questions, and I'll get into that with you. But first, I just want to introduce um, our team today who's uh, helping us out on the webinar. Uh, first up is Kristen Forey. Kristen, if you just want to tell us about yourself, she's going to be our moderator today. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Forey. I also run a um, network for educational resources for managers and board members called Community Association Network. And my company is Core Marketing Solutions. I do marketing events and I represent a portfolio of clients. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Kristen. We appreciate you moderating. Thanks so much. Um, all right. So next up is myself. I'm one of your panelists today. My name is Alex Turner. I'm with Associate Gulf Coast Management. And um, I've been in this business, uh, property management, for about, oh, about 20, 23 years. I'm a licensed CAM, licensed realtor. And um, I had my own association management firm for 10 years, and then I joined the Associate Gulf Coast team as a business development manager. And uh, this is my favorite part about the job is interacting with you guys and doing education. So thanks so much for allowing me to speak to you today. And next up is George. Take it away, George. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to all the sponsors and attendees for making this happen. Glad to be a part of it. Uh, I'm an attorney with Frisch and Ross PA. Uh, we've been uh, senior partner's been practicing this area of law, community association, general counsel work for about 30 years. I've been doing it for about 10. Uh, we represent hundreds of condo and HOA associations around Florida. Uh, we do everything from collection work, deed restriction enforcement, revitalization, renewal, governing documents, amendments, and uh, a myriad of other condo and association work with general counsel, and uh, happy to be here with you today. Thank you, George. We're happy to have you here today. All right, so on to our sponsors. And uh, without these folks, as you know, these things don't happen. Uh, so uh, Liz, you'll take it away and you've got a lot of feedback, Liz. Sorry about that. Hi, yes, and I'm Liz with Symbiant Service and I'm uh, in new business development and a little bit about Symbiant, we provide geothermal comfort solutions, specializing in air conditioning and pool and spa heating and pool cooling. Um, geothermal is where we transfer and store the energy from the earth to heat or cool your home or pool. And we use a geothermal heat pump. It's more efficient than traditional systems. It performs like gas without the need for a backup and operates at a fraction of the cost of gas. And it has a 15 to 20 life year serviceable life expectancy. So please contact me today uh, for a complimentary survey. If you're unhappy with your pool heating or air conditioning needs, and we'll be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And let's see here. Our next vendor today is uh, Console Engineering. Hey everyone, Kristen again. Consult Engineering is one of my clients. They're a structural engineering firm offering services like evaluations, reserve studies, design, bidding, and project management. They have a team of engineers, contractors, designers, and industry professionals who can assist you with any restoration project need. And now with hurricane season right around the corner, you want to make sure your community structures are up to the current Florida building codes. I know we just had a name storm last week. So go ahead and give us a call today and we'll be happy to evaluate your buildings and walk you through your next capital project. Thank you, Consult. And Lamont from Up to Par. Thank you, everyone. I'm Lamont Smith. I'm with Up to Par Management. Uh, we are a hospitality management company. We specialize working in golf communities. Uh, we uh, operate golf country clubs within communities, uh, the entire agronomic and all the uh, assets of a golf community would provide. But we also manage uh, houses within communities that don't have golf courses. 
And in those communities, we manage the dining, banquet facilities, fitness, tennis, pool, and programs and activities for the community. Um, if you are looking for a service uh, provider to uh, assist in your community's management, um, we have my information, give us a call or connect with me. We'd be happy to help. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lamont. We appreciate you being here today. All right. And CBiz Insurance. Hi again, Kristen here. CBiz Insurance is a, another one of my clients. And we know that insurance rates for associations have gone up drastically this year. And not all insurance companies have access to all the markets, but CBA does have access to every carrier so that you can get the biggest bang for your buck. Matthew Mercier is your Sarasota representative. He's also licensed to perform drone surveys for your property, something you definitely need to have done before hurricane season. So you can contact CBA today for a complimentary evaluation of all of your insurance policies. Thank you, CBiz. All right, so finally, for those of you who have not already found it, today we're gonna to be taking our questions from the chat function. So if you look in your, um, your panel over here, which I'm not sure it's on the right-hand side of my screen, um, it looks like this, you'll see this chat. And then if you extend that down, what I'm asking you to do is please with this right here where it says specify who to send to, if you'll just drop the arrow down and make that to the presenter organizer, um, that way your questions are going directly to us rather than um, popping up on everybody's screen. We just don't wanna have any distractions for everybody. So uh, while since this is a little bit different than being in person, we will be taking questions at specific times. So as long as you just ask it, I will get to it. and. Um, whatever we don't get to during the uh, the presentation, we'll certainly do at the end. Uh, so thank you again very much for everybody coming, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Kristen, take it away. Great. Thanks, Alex. Again, we're talking about how to protect your association from fraud today, and we know there are many ways that fraud can impact our associations, so we'll try to cover as many areas as we can. But today we're going to be looking at the laws that mandate fraudulent behavior and what the consequences will be for violators. So we're going to go ahead and start with the code of conduct for board members. Now the Florida legislature passed an important change on how condo and HOA boards are to conduct themselves. In 2018, the Florida Senate Bill 1682 amended Florida Statute 711. And this legislation has important issues for Floridians and includes criminal consequences for board members who break their rules. So with that, we need to take a look at code of conduct for managers on the next slide, Alice. So code 61 e 14 2.01. This standard of professional conduct says licensees shall adhere to standards of professional conduct such provisions and standards are deemed already incorporated. You are breaking up. Into any written or oral agreement for the rendition of community management. So, a look at this code. There's a, um, you can refer to that in, on your own. But, um, Alex, how can they're when entering to a contract with a management company or a manager? Sure. So, uh, Chris, and I'm just going to repeat the question for everybody. I'm going to ask if you will go off your computer um, audio and call in. You 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 are breaking up. Uh, we can't hear anything. So, if you will call oh, in, okay. and I'll go ahead and just answer while we're doing that. Again, what Kristen was talking about is up on the screen, and her question to me specifically was. How can an association significantly limit their risks when entering into a contract with a management company or manager? Um, so, and this is a this is a great question. And I know when I'm being interviewed uh, by a board, one of the questions that I get is um, is what 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 haven't we asked? What should we be asking? Um, 
usually the questions and concerns from boards are 90% driven by service, price, and personnel, which I totally understand. But the questions that you should be asking are about the um, the procedures of the company and the policies of the company. So I think there's a few topics that you need to discuss uh, with your prospective management company or even your current management company as it relates to today's fraud program. Um, so you guys are running a business. You are business uh, you're the board in charge of a business, so you have to wear that hat when you're making these decisions. Uh, but getting multiple quotes and bids uh, and writing a detailed RFP for your current for a management company is important. And this process alone will give you um, a good sense of the management company and how organized they are, how fast they are to respond. And um, in, in your RFP, you should be asking the management company to discuss. And I'm, I'm saying RFP, but I mean, you could be asking this of your current management company too. An RFP is request for proposal. Um, what is your hiring process? Are you doing full background checks on all employees or just employees working for funds, with funds, excuse me? Um, like with Associa, all employees go through a third party background check company. So it's not even within Associa. We, we go through an outside company with a full background check, drug test and the whole shebang. So um, and then what is the fidelity bond coverage of the firm? So how much how much insurance do they have on your, your association in case you know, an employee goes rogue and takes all your money to Tahiti forever. Um, so Associa has the largest amount of coverage of any management company in the U.S. with a six million dollar bond for our association. So if our if our um, agents were to uh, abscond with your money, you are covered um, for all of your funds. And then um, segregation of duties. I think sometimes we hear about this and maybe don't really realize what we're talking about, but um, this is the, one of the biggest ways to protect against fraud. And one of the key concepts uh, in internal controls over associations funds is segregation of duties. And um, it serves two key purposes. Um, it ensures that there is oversight and review to catch errors. And it also helps to prevent fraud or theft because it requires two or more, or however many people you have in the process to collude in order to hide a transaction. Um, so that's really important. So if your manager is also your bookkeeper, is also writing your checks, is also signing your checks is in everything, and you may think that's really great because it's only one person, that's where you have the highest potential of uh, fraud or embezzlement or something else. Um, FDIC insurance, make sure that your manager is keeping up with um, your bank accounts and that your money, the money in your bank is only insured up to 250000 So make sure you're using either a CD or you're employing a CDAR program through your bank uh, to ensure that all of your money is insured. Um, and make your, have your management company check on CD rates for you and do this every time it comes up for renewal because they're changing all the time. Very importantly, ensure your financials are being reconciled on a monthly basis. So this is big and I, I kind of maybe, um, I, I don't know what the word is, but I kind of thought every company did this, but I just found out recently that's not the case. So if your financials are not being reconciled monthly, then you don't have the opportunity to catch something um, within 30 days. So if, um, you know, if you only get them quarterly, then that's a long time to not see what's going on, the final product. And then, of course, your basic, when you're talking with a management company, basic, ask for three references on that management company. See what the, see what the web says, check them out. Um, and then as far as self-managed communities, all this work falls on you guys. So you have to do this legwork yourself. Background checks, references, oversight of the manager or accountant. It's really important that you take, um, you know, you take the reins on that. And I am going to real quick just check on Kristen. Are you back in, Kristen? I'm ready to... Uh handle the next slide if you're ready for me, Alex. This okay. is George. I think she is coming on right now. So let's go into the next slide. Um, criminal penalties for board members and managers. So board members and managers alike would be subject to criminal penalties when convicted of electro electoral fraud, thefts of funds, and conflicts of interest. 
the law prohibits the following situations. Kickbacks, voting frauds, theft of funds, and conflict of interest. Um, so George, without going through the entire statute, what violations would be subject to penalty? Well, Alex, um, just to give you a little bit of background on this, uh, about four or five years ago, there were reports coming out of South Florida. The Miami Herald did a major study, and some of the reports were showing that there could be as much as 30 percent fraud from kickbacks, voting fraud, theft of funds, conflict of interest, that kind of thing in the South Florida communities. So that drove the legislators down there to pass these changes that you see in both 720 and 718. And, you know, I've cut and pasted in my notes, you know, several different areas within both statutes where they've added uh, criminal penalties and the possibility of uh, criminal charges for certain things ev everywhere from uh, purposely destroying financial and accounting records to the kickbacks that you mentioned here, voting fraud, which takes can take many different forms, theft of funds and conflicts of interest. And we'll get into those in greater detail in subsequent slides. Uh, if you want to go ahead to the kickback slide. Um, Kristen, are you back with us? Hold on just, just a moment, uh, George. Kristen, are you back with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and go right into the kickbacks. Um, I think that's something that everybody wants to talk about. And um, we know that not only are taking kickbacks considered to be a civil penalty under the Florida statutes, but it's also defined as a crime under Florida Statute 617-0834. So um, now we need to clarify, and I'm sure George will go into that, that um, it doesn't prohibit an officer, director, or manager from accepting services or items if they are received in connection with trade shows or educational programs. So George, take it away and kind of clarify some of these things for us. I mean, some of my basic mantras with evaluating some of this, and you know, I, my advice may be a little bit more on the conservative side than others. Um, you know, if you avoid the appearance of impropriety, you will find yourself more often than not getting into trouble. This is not getting into trouble. This is a voluntary position as a board member. You do it for free. You shouldn't be getting uh, kickbacks. And you may be asking yourself, what's an example of a kickback? Um, if you're hiring a lawn service company to do the association's lawn and, you know, under the table, that guy's agreeing to pay you money or to cut your lawn for free, those type of things are technically kickbacks and could get you in trouble. Um, you know, try to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Um, just because you are allowed to do something doesn't mean that it's a prudent action to do it. Uh, when we get into conflicts of interest in a moment, uh, We'll tell you in greater detail a little bit how you can, uh, you know, approve a conflict of transaction. But by way of example, I'm on the board of my own HOA, relatively small one, and I don't do any legal work in that association. If I were going to do it, I would probably take the safe path and resign from the board. Um, but anyway, I, I think that uh, sufficiently covers kickbacks. Um, you know. The next question, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I just had a um, a question, George. So as a CAM, you know, of course, I go to a lot of these um, after hours events and um, we we have a lot of networking events. And um, just going back to that um, that paragraph in 718.111 about um, unless it's connected with an educational program. I mean, I'm, I guess it is fortunate they didn't clearly define what that means but i've been to some of these where um they'll you know do like a, a five you know minute spiel about um a certain thing and it, i guess is that clear for educational or um how would you view that i think the giveaways that you get at a trade show um value 25 dollars or less that type of thing is going to be okay um ask yourself if it's if it uh passes the smell test, if somebody looking on the outside in would um, view it as improper. I mean, you don't need to let your vendors or your managers take you to dinner at Burns, but uh, having a, you know, a mini stapler that has the company logo on it is probably not a big deal and probably not going to lead to criminal or civil penalties. Okay. I want to know who's right, taking well, yeah. people to Burns. <laughs> right. 
Hopefully no one. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what kind of my point is I see a lot of these events and some of them are, you know, pretty elaborate with, you know, cocktails and, you know, some nice food and, you know, and then they, they'll do like a two or three minute spiel. So that's what I'm saying. I think it's not that clear. So um, I don't know if that's coming down the path, but, um, you know. I think it boils be- down to um, a person's personal tolerance for risk. If you totally want to avoid risk, then you're not going to take any giveaways and maybe if you have a higher risk tolerance. But keep in mind, you have a fiduciary relationship to the members of your association. So you're going to want to act in a way that uh, limits association's risk as well, not just yours. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Well, let's go ahead, yes, and talk about voting fraud now. If there's a forged ballot or voting certificate in a condo election, then it is a crime punishable under Florida Statute 831.01, the state criminal law against forgery. If found guilty, the convicted member will be sentenced for committing a felony of the third degree. Um, I've seen some lawsuits um, out there, um, recent lawsuits, where this is really happening. People are getting busted for voting fraud in associations. George, are you seeing an increase in these cases? I'd say so. Um, Most recently, I've seen it um, not in an election, but a recall wherein I was representing an incoming board and they were accused of um, forging some recall ballots. But you see this voting fraud or at least the accusations of it having more um, occurring with like proxies. You see it with uh, voting certificates, ballots. Sometimes if you have a board that's holding on to power, they may... um, fall upon that as a way to attack the challenge. Um, You also see the voting fraud take the form of maybe uh, uh, a postponed meeting. If they know they're gonna get voted off, they may postpone or cancel a meeting and reschedule it. Um, You also see some of the voting fraud take the form of voter suppression and intimidation. I've seen some boards wield uh, trumped up violations and fines and the threat of that to get folks to back down on executing ballots or voting certificates or, or recall ballots, that type of thing. Wow. I know, quick story in my association, we are under 35 homes and last year they held an election. The, the prior president was president here for I think about 10 or 12 years. Um, granted, nobody wanted to do it, you know, myself included. Um, but uh, they neglected to put one of the candidates uh, on the ballot because they just didn't want to see him taking over. So <laughs> I did have to step in and say, you can't do that. <laughs> um, but they did it anyway. Interesting. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to um, cr- criminal penalties. Theft or embezzlement of, of condo funds is defined as a crime punishable under Florida Statute 812.014, the state criminal law against theft. Now, if the amount in controversy taken or stolen is high enough, then the convicted condo board member faces sentencing for a felony of the first degree. Using condo association's debit cards needs to be brought into the conversation too. I know a lot of these cases stem from that. Um, So now if you're using the card in the association name filled directly to the condo association, for anything other than an association expense, um, you can be prosecuted as credit card fraud pursuant to 817.61. And anything over $100, and this becomes a felony of the third degree. Is that right, George? I I believe you're right. I believe you're right. Um, Usually the first move I take when a client comes to us or a prospective client and they think that uh, some improprieties have occurred with regards to the association funds. Um, We do records inspection requests or look through records to see if we can find anything to back up and support that allegation. Um, You know, I had an association a number of years ago where the treasurer wrote all the checks individually, that kind of thing, and had been stealing funds. Uh, We immediately reported her to the white collar crimes division of of the county that it was involved in. And um, so go see if your county has a white collar crime division to call into and report the issues. Uh, You may also want to report it to the state attorney or the police. Um, But uh, we ultimately, in that case, the uh, board member who was misappropriating the funds was prosecuted criminally. 
ended up having to pay restitution to the association. Um, so definitely, if you find something out like that going on, report it to uh, law enforcement as soon as you can. You may be able to pursue the violator both criminally and civilly. I've seen it take many forms, this kind of theft. Uh, we had one situation where uh, a board member and her personal bank account and association bank account were housed under the same login. And this particular board member was making $30,000 worth of short-term loans um, to herself. And, uh, you know, she's you know, taking money for any amount of time, no matter whether you pay it back right away or not, is certainly punishable by criminal and civil penalties. Uh, so you want to be careful of that stuff. Wow. Well, I know, Alex, you mentioned earlier about the importance of, you know, looking at your and processing monthly um, statements, bank statements, and um, looking at those in your meetings every month. But, um, you know, I know in some cases I've, I've heard that some associations were doing this and stuff like this was going on for years until they found out. So would you would it would it be prudent to order an end of year audit that would show if there's any kind of embezzlement would that help doing that annually as well well i i mean certainly i i would definitely always be a proponent of an end of year audit um but again don't rely on your end of year audit to catch something because you need to catch that if something's going on catch it right away with those monthly uh reconciled financials um it's going to be much harder to get to the bottom of things if you have to go back through you know 12 plus months of records to find out how it happened when it happened and who did it and so on and so forth so uh, you know if you're on it and you're looking at those financials every month you should be catching it um and if you don't know how to look at your financials because listen let's face it we're not all cpas we didn't train to uh look at financials not all of us did i know some of us have a cpa on the board but as a board member you should find out how to look at your financials and what to look at in each report so you know how to check uh, you know, the checks and balances within the financials themselves. So, you know, if one number on page three is reading one way and it's another on the balance sheet, you know that something is off and it may not be, be may not being told to you that way. So, and if you're not comfortable with your management company showing it to you, get an independent CPA to review your financials with you and to show you what to look for. Um, and if you are a board where you leave everything up to, and this is sort of what George was just saying, if you leave everything up to Terry the treasurer or Pete the president, and you all just take every, you know, his, her word for everything, oh, I looked at the financials, everything's great. Well, if that's the guy, girl who's stealing your money, of course they're gonna say that. And if you're not looking yourself, then you're not gonna know. So, um, you know, take, take, take the financials into your control as well and and know what you're looking at and and as far as credit cards go um you know listen i i, I understand why associations have credit cards i think that i think it's useful um but make sure you limit the number of people that have credit cards i i don't see a reason why if you have a five member board five people need credit cards um Establish a policy, a written policy of what the use of the credit cards for. Establish a limit. So don't, you know, you don't need a high limit on credit cards. Just establish a, a small limit just so people get out and get some stuff at Home Depot and get back again. Um, make sure you're checking original receipts after each purchase and pr comparing them to what was um, to what was bought, making sure that what was purchased is what was on the receipt. Um Again, with uh, and when you're taking things back and there's if there's refunds and returns, all that you got to keep up with. Um, make the policy written that they have to sign it so they understand that this, you know, um, I'm taking this credit card on. This is not my money, but I'm going to be responsible. And if you have a credit card in your name, Pete, the president, don't give it to Terry, the treasurer and Sally, the secretary and Danny, the director, because. <laughs> Then you're then you've just literally given a card with your name on it that you're responsible for to other people to go make purchases on. And now you've become responsible for whatever they've done. If they've lost the receipt or they accidentally bought a Coke on it or whatever the situation is, now that's on your card. So um, 
And, and also if your manager has a card, which again does happen in associations, so I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but just who's looking after the manager. So if the manager has a card, are they also doing the invoicing? Are they also writing the checks? Are they also reconciling the financials? So just making sure, and I don't want to make everyone sound like they're going to uh, steal or embezzle because they're not, but these are the things that as board members, you have to have that fiduciary responsibility to look after. Well, thank you for that. And yeah, it's true. You know, the cases are maybe few or far between, at least the ones that we hear about. But the, the important thing to note is they are really cracking down on this prosecution. They are going after these people. It's not just a slap on the wrist. So at least that's um, something to keep in mind if, if you do have that problem in your association. Um, but now we're looking at, um, we need to go back one slide. Um, there are other provisions in the law that outlaw law the condo board members from buying condo units other than timeshares that have been foreclosed upon by the association, possibly for unpaid assessments. Um, also that bar the condo board from hiring an attorney who represents the association's management company. And again, that give renters of condo units the right to inspect and copy the condo association bylaws and rules. Um, now, is the Safe Harbor Act still available to a condo to condo associations in this um, area, George, who need to recoup losses of unpaid assessments? Uh, that's a pretty intensive analysis. Uh, if you're speaking about the safe harbor provision in 723.085 and 718.116, it essentially says that a subsequent owner via a first mortgage foreclosures liability to the association for any uh, that the in rim liability against the land is limited to, I believe, one year worth of delinquent assessments or, I believe, 1% of the original mortgage value. Uh, I take a look at the statute every time and I also look at the governing documents. There's usually a lien subordination clause in the governing documents, and most of those typically say that um, an owner taking title subsequent to a first mortgage foreclosure is only, uh, only has in rim responsibility for the debt that accrued after the date they took title. So it's a pretty factually intensive evaluation. Uh, a good rule of thumb and takeaway point is that if it gets all the way to a first mortgage foreclosure, there's a great chance that you're gonna to have to write off a lot of bad debt and uh, you may have to write off everything that accrued uh, prior to that date, depending on what your governing documents say. That's why one of my collection mantras is begin the process early, be willing to make a few concessions if necessary, because you're not going to want to drive the homeowner into a situation where there's a bankruptcy or first mortgage foreclosure as you will have huge bad debt write-offs. Wow. And I know that keeps changing all the time and that's probably why you, you keep saying you um, keep checking in on that. I know this is kind of off the cuff, but in our current situation with COVID-19, what, uh, what are we looking at if we, if we need to start taking, you know, procedures and foreclosure do we do we need to hold off right now or what is the law really saying about that well it's kind of scary because on the federal level they're trying to at, at least a portion of, of, of the uh, legislators up there are trying to change in the in the latest relief act they're trying to change language in the fair debt collection practices act to make it harder for condos and hoas to um, collect their assessments um, so if this is something that concerns you, and it should as a board, because you cannot provide your amenities and services to your fellow members if, if everybody quits paying, um, you need to contact your general counsel or someone involved with CAI to help lobby against it. It's pretty easy. They send you an email, you click on it, it sends a form email out to every uh, legislator and senator in your area. Um, I did it a few weeks ago. Currently, there's a moratorium on first mortgage foreclosures. I don't know if it's expired yet or will. I think the governor has extended it. It doesn't really apply, in my opinion, to condo HOA debt. Uh, you should be able to still continue pursuing condo HOA debt and, and, and filing assessment lien foreclosures. Um, there's some divergent opinions on that, but uh, I, I think the way the executive order on the state level was authored, that it specifically says first mortgage foreclosures. So, an assessment lien okay. foreclosure would be a different animal. And I think you should uh, take action to um, collect the debt. And if homeowners reach out to you with a uh, hardship, 
then you should be willing to make some concessions possibly to resolve the matter and or extend some short-term payment plans. Okay, yeah, I, I'm probably Alex is getting questions too. Uh, for some reason, people are contacting me and asking me questions like this and I just say, you know, go, go ask your attorney. So I'm sure you would probably agree with that. <laughs> Uh, yes, and you, you obviously, I've, I've got some associations that have self-enacted a moratorium on collection. I'm not a proponent of that because there really there will be people that are in great need that you want to make accommodations for. But I think you will also have a great percentage that take the opportunity not to pay for several months if you give them the opportunity to avoid that. In comparison to the first mortgage foreclosure and other debts and obligations, their HOA and uh, assessment and condominium assessment obligations, probably relatively small. So I think that you have a fiduciary duty to collect assessments. You should be proactive about it. But if people reach out to you and have a real hardship in mitigating circumstances, that's when you may want to put a moratorium or a temporary extension of time for them, that kind of thing. Okay, that's, that's good advice. Um, well, let's go ahead and move on to the topic of conflicts of interest. Now, one of the most important aspects of the major legislation that was adopted in 718-3027 was this very topic. Um, and so, George, can you walk us through what constitutes a conflict of interest? It's pretty basic. Um, in layman terms, if, and I'm going to do it by way of example, if you are the owner of a lawn maintenance company and you are on the board of your association, and you're wanting to hire your own lawn maintenance company to do the association's lawn care contract, that could be a potential conflict of interest or a conflicted transaction. Um, in my opinion, you wanna avoid that. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you may be the owner of a company in the industry where there's no competitors or it's tough for the manager to even get two or three bids. Um, so the statute enables you um, you know, the mantra there is disclose, 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 and um, abstain from voting, that kind of thing. And there's very clear methodology in the statute that may allow you to uh, approve a conflict of transaction. Even if it's properly passed and you abstain and you disclose, and that kind of thing, it can still be voided later by the membership if enough membership vote to void it. Okay. Well, let's look at the guidelines here. Um, beginning January 1 of last year, 2019, any contract or document that involves a conflict of interest must be posted on the website, the association's website, with the other official records that are required to be posted online. Um, Alex, can we look at that um, statute real quick, that guideline? And George, um, do you see anything? It seems like they're updating this all the time and adding to it what constitutes a conflict of interest. Are you seeing anything in the legislative session this year that would be adding on to this or no? Um, I'm not sure, I apologize. Um, I'm not sure if they're making any changes here. I'd have to look closer at those notes, but um, I don't think they're gonna take anything out of the statute that currently uh, uh, forbids these conflicts of interest or requires it to be properly approved. Um, your language in 720, though, I might add, is very similar to what you see in 718. Um, and, and this extends not just uh, the, the example I gave you earlier of a conflict of interest involved um, the board member himself. These conflict of interest situations, potential transaction, conflicted transactions extend to your family members, immediate family, that kind of thing. Um, so you got to be careful because if you do not properly disclose and have a conflicted transaction approved, then um, you could be removed from the board. Okay, so that kind of brings us to um, the next slide, which um, you sort of already covered, but um, just to break it down, the conflict must be disclosed to the board. The board can vote to approve the contract despite the conflict. However, acceptance of the contract must be passed by a two-thirds vote, excluding the interested director or officer, which you already mentioned. Is there any other thing that you would like to add about conflicts of interest? Yes. George? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, 
we mentioned that it must be approved. It's supposed to be approved by two thirds of the directors present at the meeting, the non-conflicted um, uh, directors. Uh, in addition to 718 that's cited there, uh, you also need to look at 617.0832 for those of you taking notes at home. Uh, it talks about the ways to get the conflicted transaction approved. Um, you're going to want to look at that closer. Okay. Like I said, it's a two-thirds uh, vote. And then at the next meeting of the members after your board uh, meeting where you're approving the conflicted transaction, you're going to want to disclose what happened to the membership. And upon motion of any member, it can be canceled. Um, this provision is similar in both the condo and the HOA statute. Um, so those are just look closely at 617.0832 to make sure that you're meeting its requirements. And there's some basic tenets too in 617. The transaction has to be fair and reasonable. So if you're paying uh, this vendor, the conflicted vendor, um, you know, 400% above market, then it doesn't matter whether the conflicted board member abstained and the proper amount of you know, non-conflicted board members voted for it, it's, it's, it's not going to pass muster and it's going to be open to challenge avoidable. Um, well, right. I would think in that case, you know, they're not performing their fiduciary duty, so it's kind of apparent. You know, like I said at the very beginning, does it pass the smell test? I mean, just use your common sense. If if it appears to be shady on the outside looking in, you're probably going to be subject to challenge. Um, and if you do have what I highly advise, if you have a potential conflict transaction, walk through it with your general counsel and your manager and the professionals you've hired to represent you and make sure that you're fully complying with everything. And if you can, just avoid the conflict altogether. Okay, well, I think that's the whole um, conversation or conflict, if you will, right there is um, obviously when this happens, um, somebody is not thinking reasonably. Um, so now once you find a board member has violated the statute, can you just remove them from the board or is there a specific process that you have to go through to get them off? That's a good question. Um, I would need to look close. I'm not sure the answer to that. I do know that, uh, for instance, if a board member's 90 days delinquent on assessment, they abandon their um, seat. Um, you would want to look closely at your association governing documents uh, because they usually have provisions talking about um, removing board members. Uh, since board members are elected by membership um, or directors at large are elected by the membership, you may have a hard time removing them, uh, but you could remove their officer position. Um, I would want to look a little bit closer at that via an opinion letter for a board before giving an answer on that. Um, I do know that the validity of board actions are not affected if it's later determined that a person that was ineligible um, to vote on a situation did. Um, you know, you, it may not void the decision made just because the person shouldn't have been involved in the decision making. Okay. Yeah, I I saw, I remember seeing a lawsuit, I think this was a couple of years back where the treasurer had a landscape company come in that they were co-owner of and did not disclose it. And then it was found that they were also um, adding a lot of miscellaneous charges to the bill that were um, not valid. And so they're really raking it in there. Um, all this came out and they could not, for some reason, they could not remove him from the board until the end of the um, trial. They, they did go after him with the attorney and, and ironically, he didn't even, he didn't step down. He stayed on the board. I, I don't know why. And uh, he and his wife actually lived, you know, obviously lived in the area and continued living there even after the lawsuit was over and they, they ended up getting, um, a heavy fine. I, I think he got some jail time. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I guess that's one of those things that every single time you'll have to check with your attorney to see what you can do and what the process is. There are certain crimes involving dishonesty, dishonesty and embezzlement, which if you're charged with the information or indictment, then the board member would be ineligible and they abandon their seat essentially until such time that those are re resolved. 
Uh, I would want to look closely, more more closely at both 720 and 718 to give you a concrete answer. But um, yeah. Okay. Well, now we've learned some common signs of potential fraud here today. Um, we're going to see these right here up on the screen. George, is there one of these signs that kind of stands out to you more than others? Any stories that you'd like to share? Well, you all mentioned earlier about reviewing your bank statements and financial statements. It's hard to do if management isn't providing them, um, which is frustrating. Uh, there's a way, there are ways to go about trying to get those. Uh, oftentimes we'll send records inspection letters certified in regular mail to trigger that process. Um, definitely look at, look at financial statements. Um, you know, you're in trouble if they don't willingly give them over. That That's when it gets problematic because by the time you get litigation started and pursue that aspect of it, the money's gone. Um, you know, if you really think that there's fraud and you want to get them off the board as soon as possible and they're not sharing records, maybe you have to try a recall petition. Uh, the ballots are right on the um, Department of Business Professional Regulation website. Um, you get 51% of those and you can get those folks off the board. Sometimes that's the easiest way to get to the bottom of it. Um, like you said here, unnecessary repairs being made. Uh, if you see trumped up um, invoices for services that you know to be uh, outside the normal price in the market for that type of service. Um, Sometimes you'll see invoices for vendors that don't exist or companies you've never heard of, and you have a hard time tracking the payments. Um, like you say here, unnecessary repairs, forged signatures, um, re uh, an inordinate amount of reimbursement requests. You know, board members shouldn't be going down to lows every time and, and buying a ton of stuff. That'll happen occasionally, but most of these things are going to take place via a contract with a vendor or they're going to talk about it in meeting minutes. Uh, that's that's another way to find this stuff in meeting minutes. If you look through a year's worth of meeting minutes and you see no conversations about expenditures or trips to lows or that kind of stuff, but yet you see all these reimbursement requests that may be a sign that there's some fraud going on. Okay, so let's look at some action steps that we can take to prevent fraud. Um, additional of ways that we can look at what we can do. George, it seems like a lot of these are bank related. Um, would you say that that's the banking, the balance sheets, um, all of that is the, is the most common area where you can find the fraud? That's, um, I would agree. Um, what I'm noticing, and I don't deal with the banks as often as a manager does, and Alex would have some great guidance on this, but what I'm observing is certain banks have better tailored HOA condo uh, products than others. In one of the fraud situations I saw, this particular bank was allowing the treasurer, board president, whatever position this board member had, was allowing them to log in and be able to access both personal and HOA accounts through the same log on. So it essentially made it really easy for this person to abuse the system and loan money from one account to the other, commingle funds, if you will. So get with your management company and they're going to point you in the direction of a bank that has more tailored condo HOA products. Not every bank does. Um, that, that's the main thing right there. And, and that's why I encourage most self-managed companies to hire reputable managers. Um, number one, uh, they're doing it every day and are going to be better at it than you, especially if they're a quality company. And number two, if they screw up, you have somebody to go after. I mean, if it's not a quality company and they're the ones that are um, perpetrating the fraud, um, more than likely they have insurance coverage and that kind of thing. Um, all these are great pointers here. Limit access, multiple um, checkpoints. You want your checks and balances along the way to make sure one person running everything and not sharing information is a situation ripe for fraud. Uh, you want to make sure you're supervising employees, checking in on them periodically, use signature cards, PIN numbers, authorization codes. Uh, like it says here, require more than one signature on association checks. Um, and, you know, checks and balances is the way to go. 
the temptation is too great if only one person is controlling everything. Alice, any, any comments on your side? Yeah, I, I agree. Just picking up exactly where George left off is, again, segregation of duties is just key to making sure that there are a couple pairs of eyes on what's going on. Um, and then as far as banking is concerned, uh, agreed, a good association bank is is key and being able to, um, board members can have, you know, viewing access of items. There are also, um, you know, programs that different uh, association management companies have, like, for instance, we use uh, strong room, which which um, works in tandem with the bank to show all the daily reports that board members can get in and look at 24 hours a day, seven days a week without having that um, that fraud, the option of fraud or being able to get in and actually get the money out or anything of that nature. So, um, yeah, these are all really good points. And again, just just knowing your financials and um, keeping up on them as board members is also just really key. Well, great. Thank you both for this great information today. I'm sure um, George is available if you have any additional questions. But Alex, do you do you have any um, questions that have come through during our conversation? Yeah. So let's see here. Um, I'm just reading these. So uh, from David, how to handle a vendor who is not qualified, unlicensed who is not qualified, an unlicensed plumber that the treasurer and board members uh, don't see an issue with. Um, so how to handle that when, you're, when your board is hiring um, unqualified, non-licensed uh, vendors? I'll, I'll give you my answer on this, and then I'll let I'll turn it over to the legal answer. Um, you know, with us with you're self managed, so I know exactly what you what you're saying. But you know, our as a management company, we would don't uh, we don't hire and we don't uh, allow anyone to work on a property that is that isn't licensed or insured. Um, so as a self managed community, you know, your board is going to have to uphold those same standards and. Um, uh, you know, obviously you seem concerned about that, David, and I would definitely bring that up in a public meeting, you know, but go ahead, George, what's your thought on that? Well, I think, you know, as he's alluding to, if you're the minority voice on the board and the rest of the board doesn't agree with you that, hey, we need people that are licensed, insured, uh, have workers comp, that kind of thing, they don't agree with you, then it kind of handicaps you a little bit in trying to avoid that contract or not hire that particular individual. Uh, there may be mechanisms within the statute and the governing documents that may allow you to avoid the contract with the appropriate amount of membership um, approval. Uh, you could try to recall the board if you think they're doing something that exposes you to a lot of risk uh, and take a look closer look at your governing documents. There may be a way for you to override the majority approval. Um, you know, at, at least I never advise uh, hiring folks that don't have the proper coverage and in, in, in licensure and insurance, um, at least if they're going to go that route uh, against your opinion and advice, then try to make the vendors sign some type of waiver of liability, that type of thing, um, to protect yourself at least in a minimum amount. Um, and you want to check with your insurance provider to see if there is a special uh, policy or rider or coverage that you could get to cover that type of situation or transaction so that you have extra protection. Um, those are the only ways I can think of other than, you know, voting off the board members that uh, you think are making the wrong decisions. Yeah, and I, I just to follow up, and I'm certainly not uh, not saying this is what David's talking about, but we understand that there are volunteers and associations. We understand that board members will sometimes go and plunge a toilet so they don't have to call out a plumber. So I'm not speaking to those actions. I'm I'm talking about a board going out and you know a contractor for a job you know that's bigger than a normal volunteer could handle. All right, we have a question from uh, Glenda. Can you tell us where to find the recall ballots? Uh, that's pretty easy. Easy. If you just Google um, Florida HOA or Florida condo recall ballot, it's the first thing that will pop up. There's a PDF that's readily available out there on the Internet. You could go to the DBPR website if you're having trouble with Bing or Google, but uh, it should be relatively easy to find. It's a one page form. If you fill it out properly, it's going to leave you less susceptible to challenge um, when you present and serve the current board with the recall 
uh, petitions. Okay, and just to comment, um, uh, we have on our um, one of our attendees today, Percy is a um, CPA and he works on association accounting. Uh, his his firm does, and he said that they have seen an uptick in fraud as people are losing their jobs because of the COVID situation. So this could be a very real situation for you know our our associations down the road. Um, what other questions do we have? Oh, Percy also says definitely one of the best practices is to have the board review and approve all expenditures at a board meeting. So you have time for that. That's awesome. And let me just make sure there's no other questions here. I saw a question about uh, early on about getting involved in the legislative process. Um, one way is through your Community Association Institute Action Network, and um, they support uh, lobbying efforts up in Tallahassee to exact the kind of changes that we feel are favorable for the industry. So that's one way to get involved. Another way may be uh, to speak to your general counsel. Um, there's a uh, a group of my um, peers and, and competitors in the industry around the state, and they have an action committee that debates proposed changes, and they probably, I think, work in, in concert with CAI and other uh, trade networks as well. So getting involved in CAI and letting um, your general counsel know that you're interested in affecting a particular change could be one way to get the process started. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. So you were reading about the how can I propose legislation? Okay, great. Yep. Thank you for answering that. I was way up at the top. Um, and then I had a question uh, from somebody asking about how to read their financials. So, um, uh, you know, again, without knowing the actual program and seeing the financials, um, you know, I can definitely help offline on that, uh, Mary. So we can do that. I just don't off the top couldn't couldn't answer that question for you. And then um, there was a question regarding strong room um, and how board can use strong room to access the financial data. So strong room is a program that I know uh, several management companies use, Associa uses it. And it's basically ours is routed, um, connected directly to our the bank account for the associations. And um, you are given, the board members are given a password to get into strong room and all of your financial data is in there. So your, uh, your balance sheet, your budget reports, your member delinquency report is in there. Your, your invoices are in there. And um, that's where everything sits and is housed. And you can log on there 24 hours a day, seven days a week and see it. It's not your end of month reconciled um, information, but it's it's everything in there. And because it's connected to the banks, for instance, your member balance sheet, which maybe you don't typically see except on a once a month basis unless you ask for it sooner. Um, this is updated three times a day. So you'll actually know, did Mrs. Smith pay her fees like she said she was going to yesterday? You could actually look the next day and find out. So, uh, and I'm glad to get into to more details on that with you, Jim, if, if need be after the after the um, seminar. And I think that was, oh, no, nope, hold on. We have another one. Okay. Uh, can you tell me who to contact to lobby against any federal new, uh, any federal new laws to limit condos ability to collect maintenance fees? If you want to have them email me, I can uh, forward them the link. Um, I got an email about it within the last week, and it made it pretty easy to uh, voice your opinion. Um, I think it was CAI that sent it out, but it wouldn't be hard for me to find. If they just want to email me at grood at frpalegal.com, I could uh, forward them the link, uh, okay. and it makes it really easy. It took me five minutes, and it sent, it sent off my um, uh, issues with it to about – three or four different representatives up in the federal government. So it's effective. Okay. Uh, George's information is on the screen. I'm going to leave that up there for everyone to write down. Um, from David, the question is, what regular financial reports are required at each board meeting? Um, so, uh, you know, David, I don't, 
I'll just answer from my end. And George, you can certainly pick up on anything legal wise again. I don't know that there's any legal requirement for any specific reports at a board meeting. I think typically boards give their treasurer report at a meeting to kind of give an overview of their finances. And um, some associations may be working off their fully reconciled financials, while others may be working off just a brief treasurer report. So I think that's really more of what your board um, wants to do. But typically, when we give a treasurer report, you're giving, um, you know, your your the cash in the operating account, cash in the reserve account, what the delinquencies are, um, you know, if you have a loan, what the loan balances are. So those kind of general general um, numbers. Uh, but George, are you aware of any uh, re financial reports that are required at a meeting? Um, no, I mean, your statute, both the condo and HOA side, 718, 720, both have annual meeting and um, or annual reporting and budget processes that occur annually. Uh, if you may want to look at your bylaws because your bylaws may have a more stringent reporting requirement, although I don't see them often. Um, I mean, I think it's a good rule of thumb to share um, financials as much as you can and be transparent as long as it doesn't put an undue burden on you. Uh, but no, I can't think uh, off the top of my head any specific every meeting requirement to provide um, you know financial reporting and budget information. Sure. Yeah. I, again, I don't know about any specific reports, but I do think it's good practice for the board to give a brief overview on the finances at each meeting. Um, and then, of course, like what we do is, you know, the board gets a full copy of the financials every month. And then the membership for us, we put it on their uh, our version of websites, which is called Town Square. We put up a brief version of the financials for the remaining uh, members of the community. And that's going to be your balance sheet, your P&L or your revenue expense, uh, your budget report. Um, and those are the things that the people need to see to know what the financial status is. It's not going to have bank bank account statements. It's not going to have uh, who's late. We don't want to give out that info. But um, it's just a nice uh, report for people to see on a monthly basis. All right. Um, I think I'm just reading through one last question. Yeah. So Percy was mentioning that condos require um, condos over 150 units require certain reports to be on the website. And that's correct. So uh, uh, condominiums with over 150 units require a website now and their their reports and documents have to be posted on that website. That's correct. Um, Okay, and um happy to talk to you, Teresa, offline about anything going on there. And I think that's um I think that's all the questions. So um Kristen, thank you for your time today. George, thank you for all of your great information today and for all those that logged on. I appreciate your time and again, uh really proud of you guys for staying um staying focused through all of this and being great board members and uh, be safe, be well, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone.